Hello YouTube, this is the uh, Taurus 38 special. Um, we're reshooting this video, you may have seen it before and uh, been laughably disappointed that uh, my hands were out of frame for most of the video, so we're going to try this one again. <clears throat> this is a, one of the more generic um, firearms in the universe. Uh, very popular, relatively inexpensive, very reliable. Um, just a straightforward gun. This is a stainless steel one, obviously, but they are uh, commonly found blued. Um, the uh, model has changed a little bit uh, over time, so makes it a little challenging getting replacement parts sometimes. Um, but most of the time, you don't have parts that break. There are a few things that people tend to lose, however, and uh, we'll talk about all that. Either way, without further ado, we're going to start... Um, by uh, removing the cylinder and we'll go ahead through the cylinder um, disassembly process first. So this first screw here holds in uh, the cylinder itself and the screw comes in a couple different variations. Um, this is the most common where there's a detent and a spring built into the body of the screw and uh, sometimes though there's just a solid point on the screw uh, you know it's not overly important the, this mechanism tends to um, if you're careful this one will last longer both of them have the same gener general failure that if somebody tries to take the cylinder off without taking the screw all the way out they make a mess of things so once that screw is out uh, open the cylinder you know, cylinder release here and slide out you know, just straight by the crane and set the frame aside so disassembly um, this is something that uh, can cause some... Actually, let me pop this out first. This is uh, the spring that provides um, the force for the bolt stop. Um, so that will be attached on a little peg like that. Uh, don't lose this. Putting it together without this will stop the cylinder from indexing. This is a piece that gets lost a lot, so hang on to it. Um, <clears throat> this is something where... Uh, there's a great deal of debate in design about the right way to make these. Uh, what we're going to do is um, remove the ejector. The ejector is screwed in, and um, depending on whether the firearm is left or right-handed, meaning whether the cylinder drops out to the left or right, will change the way that uh, you're going to want this piece to be threaded. You don't want, when the cylinder is turning in the normal direction that it turns, which I can't actually remember on this one let's see this one turns uh, counterclockwise and so uh, you want that to always be tightening um, you don't want to be firing the gun and risk loo loosening the extractor uh, so this is actually essentially threaded backwards left-handed so we're gonna actually turn it to the right to unscrew it um, not all revolvers are like that uh, Smiths tend to go one way Colts tend to go another so uh, the actual ejector rod in the middle. Um, there's a small spring on the back uh, and a uh, raised area that keeps it centered. And um, then the, ex the uh, ejector itself can slide out from the front. And there's a, a groove in there that aligns with a groove in the uh, cylinder insert. Once it's at this point, um, you can now remove the crane. If the whole thing is assembled, it's very difficult to remove the crane uh, on this particular model because the crane snaps into this bushing. And so for the crane to snap out, the bushing actually has to have room to flex in. And if this piece is in place, the, the bushing can't do that. So this, this piece is too wide and fills up that center hole. Um, but once that's out of the way, you should be able to pull the bushing, uh, excuse me, pull the crane out. And as you can see, the bushing also starts to uh, come loose and flop around now. So <clears throat> uh, that's an important thing. Don't try and pull this apart while, while this is still in there, or you won't be able to. And when you go to put it back in, notice that that would push the bushing up. So you have to hold the bushing down when this snaps back in to get it in place. So anyway popping that apart again there's the final spring on the inside and uh, a spacer 
so it has the spacer on one end and the bushing acts as a spacer on the other end. Uh, so what's going on in there is that that spring is around uh, the ejector. This rod goes straight through the middle and then this is uh, capping the whole thing off, again, reverse threaded. So when you uh, push the ejector in, you're pushing against this spring. So this spring brings it back. And then this piece, which uh, causes it to snap uh, the cylinder into place in the frame, this uh, actually, if I pull up the frame here, there's a corresponding round peg there that is actually uh, attached to the, the release. And so the uh, when you're pushing the release forward, that's when you're pushing on this pin, and that's actually activating that other small spring on the back. So the small spring wants to push this forward, which when the cylinder is all the way in, it'll pop it into that hole, which keeps it set, uh, centered because it's a stronger spring than the one operating this, so it wins out. But when you go to disassemble it, then you're pushing against it, which pushes that out, which lets it slide forward. So anyway, um, for cleaning, uh, you just want to remember the order that everything goes in. I tend to try and you know, lay it out exactly as, as everything goes. This spring isn't actually directional, so if you take the bushing out to clean it, it doesn't matter if you get it backwards. The bushing generally sits pretty well on the spring. And then uh, for cleaning this stuff, pipe cleaners, very helpful. Uh, a good plastic toothbrush to get in all these areas. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, if you shot it a lot without cleaning it, fouling can build up on this, which prevents it from not only uh, seeding properly, but will also make it harder for rounds to go in and out and it'll make it tighter and tighter over time. You can pop this bushing out if you need to. Um, there's no uh, particular reason to, but you, you could if you wanted, I suppose. I find it's uh, unnecessary to do so. Um, there is a indexing, let's see if I can't pop it out there. Sorry, I know that's upside down from the camera. There we go. So the indexing pin there is uh, what slides along this to keep this oriented. And uh, the reason that they do that, there's a couple different things that make that uh, fit uh, perfect. One is that the extractor is you know, put in place. It sits on those pins and it slides along that indexing one. Um, so that the chambers can be cut uh, perfectly so that this fits perfectly flushly and uh, you need that so the disc actually picks up on the rims and if you spun it around you know if you if you were able to what you would find is it doesn't quite make a perfect connection with the other ones so it's important that it has the ability to index itself again this bushing you got to make sure to be careful that you line up that indexing pin with any of the channels uh, or it's not going to go in. <clears throat> um, let's see, that's about it. So like I said, pipe cleaners, toothpicks, clean everything and uh, a lot of fouling will build up along the backs uh, of the crane and, and again anywhere that it gets fouled prevents the thing from moving. This area especially uh, will, will prevent the uh, cylinder from spinning freely and that's always bad, so you want to make sure that the cylinder spins freely. Um, and uh, that's that's it mechanically. It's not uh, overly complicated. So for reassembly, um, the bushing end uh, goes, goes in. Again, we're going to hold this uh, bushing in as we snap the crane back on so that it snaps into it. And then we put the, whoops, uh, slide this into place, and then the rod itself, the small spring, and then we uh, screw this back on. Remember that it's left hand threaded, and get it nice and snug. 
so let's let's talk about just putting that back on for now since this is arguably a field strip style position before we get into the meat of it don't forget to put the spring back on and just slide the, uh, the crane in and then close it and then put this pin back in the screw rather excuse me and then I'm going to show you briefly an important thing about revolvers that you don't learn if you watch the movies so if you've ever seen somebody playing with a revolver this is something people love to do it's not terrible for the device but it's not necessarily helping it in any way but the crane is all you're pushing against so it's pretty stable the crane itself is generally substantial however if you ever see somebody do this that is one of the worst things you can ever do to a revolver the problem is is that if this rod or more importantly the small rod that's right inside this if either of those gets bent then the cylinder does not spin correctly and, and it's no longer true so as soon as you slam that thing shut you run the risk of basically if this this spring-loaded mechanism here is a little on the tight side then this big heavy cylinder is going to push closed first and maybe this isn't going to snap over evenly basically i've seen so many revolvers ruined because this stuff is all crooked and once it's caddy wumpus you got to replace it all so when you go to close it either close it by pushing on the crane itself so it's you know pushing in the center or um you know basically on the sides pushing both the extractor in and the cylinder in at the same time best though is the crane itself that's that's putting the pressure right at a perfect spot so that it goes in evenly um, as we said this little spring when we close it we're going to see that push this piece back so first you'll notice there's a ramped area on on the frame itself that's going to gently push that in so as it goes closed it begins to push that in but when it hits the actual closed position it pushes this back and then of course we push right back so that it can come out so now we're going to take that back apart so we can actually go inside the uh, entire frame. Set that aside. And uh, now Take off the um, grip so that we can see the other screws that hold the thing together. We can see half of one of the screws already, but there's a second one up here that we can't see till we get the grips off. So this is a single screw that goes all the way through and screws into the, the left grip. Now you may have wooden grips, you may have rubber grips, there's a whole lot of aftermarket grips, but at the end of the day, uh, it's all all more or less the same the grips will probably have molded parts that fit into each other as well as a fairly you know robust molding to the frame itself and mine a little bit sticky that's kind of gross so uh, again there's just a, a solid insert in this actually it might be wood I'm not even sure what it is that's reinforcing that but anyway grips aside. Now we can kind of uh, see a little bit about uh, the workings of it. Two screws holding the rest of it together. And um, now uh, with the cylinder out, uh, not going to be able to pull the hammer back and, and please don't ever pull really hard on the trigger with the cylinder out. The mechanism that's blocking it is actually based on where this latch is. So normally the cylinder would be pushing this latch into a back position. When that happens, then the whole thing uh, can actually operate. It can both be cocked and fired and go through the firing sequence. And if you've never looked at your revolver in slow motion, uh, you can basically uh, watch this window. This is called the window and that piece is called the hand. And that's the part that rotates the cylinder. So as you start to pull the trigger, as well as the hammer being cocked back, the hand is coming out and lifting up. That's gonna 
catch on these poles in the cylinder and cause the cylinder to rotate to the next chamber. And uh, now down at the bottom, as I mentioned, we took out this little guy, which operates when he's pushed in there. Let's see if I can push him in there. Actually, I might not be able to do that without something a little bit larger. I'll just stick in there temporarily. There, the, uh, the, the bolt or the cylinder stop. This is the piece that's normally actuating that. Uh, that's why it's inserted into the crane there. And uh, what we're gonna see as we begin is that that piece drops down as well. So basically, that's what has to happen for the cylinder to move. When this is up, the cylinder can't move. So the first thing in our trigger pull is while the hand is coming out of the window, the bolt is being pulled down into the frame. So now the bolt is in the frame, which means the hand can start to rotate the, uh, the cylinder into that next position. And then the hand, uh, excuse me, the bolt comes back up halfway through that stroke so that it stops the cylinder exactly on a cylinder. And then we see the firing pin when the hammer uh, comes forward. Notice that the firing pin does retreat uh, and we'll see exactly how that hammer mechanism works in a minute. Uh, let's see. So to get to the next step, we need to take out these two screws and I need my smaller bit. Now this is another time where getting a good set of gunsmith screwdrivers is important. This is not a good set that I'm using now. A proper set I don't have here at home, which is because I'm too lazy to bring them in from work. Uh, but basically you want a screwdriver that perfectly fills that slot. If it's too narrow or not wide enough, then you get monkeyed up mangled screws. Now, if the screw is completely covered by a grip, maybe it would go unnoticed, but if it's one of the prominent ones, the you know, gun's gonna look ugly. This one's all scratched to hell anyway. I got it for 10 bucks, so, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, now, if you look, there is a seam uh, along the frame. This is the frame cover, and uh, they're also m more fragile than they look. And so uh, the the instinct of how do I get this off is to stick something in there and pry it off. That's a terrible idea because it will never ever seat as well as it does when you get it from the factory. If you pry it up, it will never ever seat nicely again. So you really want to use some other mechanism of getting this off. And um, fortunately, there's really only uh, a couple ways to do that. And one of them is to tap it with something soft. This is rubber. So by just tapping on the other parts of the frame, you're basically letting the momentum uh, pop this off for you. And so notably, this leading edge of it actually goes into the top of the frame. And then all of this essentially has to seat at the exact same time. So if you pry one side out, a, you're, tor you're putting torque on this, which is going to put torque on this, and it's just going to mess this up. So letting it pop itself off is always the best way to get it out. The downside is that um, it can also make your guts come flying out all over the place, and so if you don't really know where they are, that can be problematic. <laughs> so another thing I'm going to caution you on is to never uh, operate um, the gun without the... The, the frame closed. So all of these pins are attached to the frame itself, but they are supported very much so by the fact that they go into this plate. So all of those pins, especially the trigger pin here, right now it's only supported where it's welded or molded, depending on the, the model, into the frame itself, which means it's only got half its support. So if I tried to pull the trigger right now, I would be putting an enormous amount of stress on this pin and likely shear it off. 
once this pin or any of these pins is sheared off, you've pretty much ruined the revolver because the only way to fix a broken pin is to drill a hole into the revolver, weld in a new pin, and you're never going to get a, a good finish again uh, for anywhere near what you paid for the revolver originally. So we do need to, however, uh, operate a couple things here, and I need to find a little tiny piece of metal, first of all. So this is a good place for a paper clip sized piece of metal. And I had one here just a little while ago. I'm going to use this screwdriver for now. So uh, again, keeping in mind that you do have to retract that to do anything, what we want to do is, is cock it, uh, but don't use the trigger. This pin is more substantial, so we're going to... Um, here, that's actually what you can see when I move this. What's actually happening here is I'm moving this piece and that's gonna, when this piece is here, the hand itself is running into it. So that's what stops it when you try and cock it. The, the hand can't come up and that blocks everything else. When this is moved back, the hand can clear that. So we're gonna cock it and then there's a little hole um, in this uh, strut. And that's where we wanna shove something um, temporarily and what we're going to do now is again fire the gun so I'm holding the hammer so I don't just completely drop it and gently release the trigger and now what we've done is we've captivated the spring uh, now I'm sorry that I used a spring that's probably not the best example but anything that fits in that hole a paper clip is generally the go-to tool for this particular task but the point is it, it keeps this spring captivated this is a very heavy spring I want to say 25 28 pounds so if you actually took this apart it's takes a lot of force to get it back on so the it's best to just leave it captivated um, some of them have slightly different variations on this base plate, but at the end of the day, it will have something that, that holds it into the frame there. But once it's captivated, you know, then you can just lift it out. So now, I'm just going to stop doing this upside down. Um, let's see, what's the easiest thing to take out next? Do, 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 do. Um, Uh, so the hammer can't come straight off right now because the hammer actually goes far enough forward to be obstructed a little bit by the frame. So again, remembering that you, have, you still have to operate that for any of this to work. If you move the hammer back to about there, and we can just hold the trigger in place, you may have just enough space for it to clear the hand here and clear the top of the frame at the same time, and you can slide the hammer out. Now, if for some reason you can't get it out, you don't have to take the hammer out at exactly uh, this position. We can also take the hand apart a little bit first instead. So the hand is on a, a spring-loaded mechanism here. Um, and uh, basically if we, uh, oops, excuse me. If we just push the hand back a little, then we can actually pull it straight up out of the trigger. It's going into the trigger and then it also has a little spring. Now we want to put our thumb back here to catch that spring. Should it come flying out, it usually doesn't launch itself. But basically just torque the hand back a little bit and lift it right out. And here you can see the short pin is what where it goes into the trigger and that's what it rotates around. And this longer pin is really just what uh, this spring detent pushes on. So with this out of the way, um, it's it's much easier to get the hammer off now. We can just back the trigger off a little bit and the hammer comes right out. Um, the the leg of the hammer here uh, uh, is peened in so there's a spring and then this pin that, that holds it in and there's a little spring under there. Because this one's peened in, there's no reason to take it out unless you were replacing it. This little surface here is the actual uh, sear surface for the um, uh, the single action stroke. So when you when you cock the hammer first, this will be being held by. Uh, well, once I get the trigger spring out of there, we'll actually demonstrate both of those. So hold that thought for a moment. 
Um, now, the trigger itself. Uh, let's see. What's the best way to do this? Uh, once again, we're going to need another um, paper clip style chunk of spring. And then once again, I'm just going to use a piece of spring that I have lying around. Uh, now here's where you have to be careful because you've got the hammer strut out of the way, but again, when we're actuating the trigger, which we're about to do, we're going to be putting more stress on that pin than we want. So get something ready. In this case, I have this little piece of uh, spring steel. And again, we're going to jam it into a small hole on the... Uh, strut here and so as we bring the trigger back what we'll see is there's a small hole in that uh, rod and we're gonna stick whoops we're gonna miss apparently because this is a poorly chosen piece of metal let me see if I have a better piece of metal lying around <laughs> This is what happens when I clean things up, as I've removed my giant piece of spring stock, which is normally sitting around taking up space, right as I need a piece of it. Oh, well, let me just try and modify this a little bit better. So again, I'm going to try and move the trigger back without creating any more force on that pin than I need to. I slide my makeshift bent up piece of wire through the hole. And there we go. So the whole point of that is again, captivating this spring. So once it's captivated, you can actually lift up on uh, This whole, this whole piece here will come right out of the frame. Uh, looking for something. Oh. So, <clears throat> that you know, lug was sitting in there, so we've kept this, this system captivated as well. Obviously I've got some dark colored grease on there. Uh, but again, keeping that one captivated means that it's much easier to reassemble. If you've ever had to work on a uh, Smith & Wesson, you'll know that uh, their mechanism for dealing with that spring is much different and much more of a pain in the butt. Now, when I did this, I inadvertently cheated uh, and knocked this piece out of place. See if I can set it back down where it belongs. Okay, so this is the uh, trigger mechanism in play, and this is the, uh, it's a safety of sorts. Um, the hammer itself, if we put this guy partially back together, um, if you notice that the, this is our firing pin here, and if we take this out, then the firing pin will come out. But the point is, the firing pin is spring-loaded. But when the hammer is all the way forward, it doesn't, it can't reach the firing pin. So um, by design, this striker plate has to be between the hammer and the firing pin when the hammer falls for the hammer to actually reach the firing pin. Which means that if the gun is somehow cocked, but the uh, trigger is not being pulled this plate won't be up there and uh, the result when the trigger is pulled the plate stays up there and so when the hammer comes down it hits the plate so if something breaks in this mechanism uh, and the hammer comes free of the trigger when the trigger is not being pulled so the gun is dropped and something bad happens if this pin happens to break at the wrong time any kind of mechanical failure 
when the hammer falls, it'll, it won't hurt anything. It won't strike the firing pin. So the trigger has to be pulled to get that plate in place, at which point then the hammer can fall and hit the plate, and that's what gives you your firing pin uh, protrusion. So um, I also want to temporarily take this spring out so we can look at do 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 uh, I'll show you how the hand actually works oh we've got all this apart so take that detent and its spring out um, again the purpose of that spring was really just to keep the hand coming as far forward as it can um, but we're going to put it back together temporarily without any of the springs in there so we can talk about function. So um, for the double action pull, uh, you begin to pull the trigger and uh, do, 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 do. oh, of course, the first thing that we're bumping into is the cylinder stop. So it won't, the, you can't pull the trigger if the cylinder's not in there. So pulling back on the cylinder release simulates having the trigger in there excuse the cylinder in there. We can begin to pull this and we can see that that lifts the hand up which is because of that other spring that we just took out on the bottom pushing on the bottom that means it pushes inside that brings the hand in interacts with these halls on the cylinder to cause it to lift meanwhile the striker plate is being raised into position and the um, uh, hammer itself hand is blocking our view so let me take the hand out for this we understand what the hand does um, when we're doing this so as I begin to lift the remember that there's a big spring pushing the hammer forward so it's the top of the trigger that's actually lifting up on that spring loaded leg for the beginning of this whole stroke oops now I've gone too far so let's do that again so we're coming up, we're coming up, uh, we're still, um, we, we begin, you know, on that, but then we transfer and this ledge here at the back of the trigger right here is going to grab the underside of the hammer. And so now we've transferred our point of contact from this curved edge meeting this curved, uh, meeting this leg of the hammer to this surface here being underneath the hammer and when we get far enough forward that slips off and the hammer can come down when you let up on the trigger the reason that this leg is spring loaded is so that the hammer can swing past it so again when you're pulling the trigger first you're lifting it up by this piece and then it smoothly transitions to lifting it up on this edge and the underside which gives us a very sharp sear surface for the brake so it's a it's a seamless transfer from one to the other and then the brake is just right there when this piece slips right past it now that's one way is the double action pull where first action is cocking the hammer second action is releasing the hammer you can also cock the hammer manually now in this when you're cocking the hammer that big trigger return spring is wanting to keep the trigger in a forward position so I'm gonna simulate that with my thumb so as the hammer comes up things are working a little bit differently now it's the top side of this little ledge of the hammer lifting up on this lip and it's going to do that until it reaches that point at which point you hear that solid click and now you're in the sear cut of the hammer and the very pointy edge of the rounded bit of the trigger so i'm going to pull those out and we're going to look at those components specifically out of the gun so um you can see this up close and personal here yeah so uh for the double action it's the top surface pushing up on the leg for a while but then it's this surface pushing on the underside that takes you through the rest of the single action or the double action pull 
until it slips past and the hammer falls. On the single action, you're cocking it by moving the hammer up, pushing on the underside of this surface, and that's going to come uh, and pull the trigger back and lift up and up and up. But from the geometry, what's going to happen is you're going to slide right over that and click there. And that's where your main sear engages in the hammer. And at that point, it's holding it there. And so that's manually cocking it. So it's very different mechanisms for, for each of those actions, uh, but they all go together to uh, make the whole thing work. Um, the uh, the strike plate uh, just goes into um, the same hole technically that the hand goes into, just the other side of it, which is why um, on the hand itself it's a it's a half pin, and on this it's a half pin because they're both going into the same hole. So that on the bottom, and the uh, oops, and the hand on the top, so they go in like that. And uh, like I said, this long leg here is specifically just to uh, be actuated by this spring. So that's what, that's what makes the hand uh, push forward all the time. So that's all those parts. Uh, do, 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 do. The other mechanism is the, um, the interaction between... Um, the, the spring which goes in here which as you see when something uh, goes in there that it, it's just pushing up on the back of this which causes the hand to go up and what we'll do is we'll show how the trigger actually interacts with that um, so let's try and hold this all up at one time so we can see it all at once so I'm using this punch to provide what would otherwise be spring tension. So as we begin to pull the trigger, um, the first thing that's going to happen is this edge of the trigger is going to pull down on the hand, excuse me, on the bolt, and drop the bolt just long enough to let, let the hand begin to rotate the cylinder. It doesn't have to do it for very long, because once the cylinder's begun to rotate at all, then you'll be past these lockup zones. And so um, as we begin to pull the trigger, it brings the hand down for just a second, but long before we're you know, particularly far into the trigger pull, it's going to slip past it, so about halfway through the trigger pull, and that lets this pop back up. And at that point, it's only being operated by spring tension, so as soon as the next locking spot comes around on the cylinder, it's going to snap into it and prevent the cylinder from over-rotating. So even if you squeeze the trigger super hard and give it a ton of momentum, um, this is going to have popped up and intercept it uh, and stop the cylinder when it's perfectly lined up with the bore. And um, when this comes back over, it just pushes the whole thing uh, back a little bit to reset it. And when it does that, it really is just moving the bolt straight uh, forward and back. It doesn't actually bring it down. And so basically the bolt just shifts a little bit forward, but doesn't come down at all. So uh, trigger. Um, this tends to be a very tight fit. Uh, if you want to get this off, you're going to have to essentially fiddle with it a bit because you have to find a position where the hand is down just about all the way onto that pin and then somehow you know get under it uh, to get it moving sometimes sometimes you get lucky and you can tap it out sometimes sometimes you don't um, so mm -hmm. ah, there we go uh, again, if it's if it's up into the frame at all, it's not gonna it's not gonna come out. So you got to be fairly careful there. Um, again, other than just cleaning it up and, and re-greasing it, there's no real reason that you have to remove that piece. Getting it back on is similarly a little bit of a challenge, and just that it really has to be lined up fairly perfect for it to to drop in there. 
and once it's perfectly horizontal, it'll fall right down into place and pop up into the window again. I'm covered with molybdenum, so don't lick your fingers. Uh, let's see, what's left? Uh, the firing pin um, is got this tiny little pin that's holding it in against its spring, so I'm going to put a finger behind here so I don't launch it across the room and lift this pin out, at which point the firing pin itself uh, is now free to, to slide generally out. Urgh. <laughs> and so there's the firing pin, and then there's also a small spring in there, which I'm going to have to dig out. <laughs> Carefully. So this is just a small coil spring that goes over the firing pin, and again, the cutout and the firing pin is just because that's where the retaining pin passes through it. So the firing pin can move along the retaining pin, but not fall out or go too far forward to puncture the primer. So that's that mechanism. And then the only thing we have left in the main frame is the uh, rear screw, or the, uh, sorry, the cylinder release. This is another one which the part has changed significantly over time. So sometimes it's going to be, in this case, mine is just a regular screw. Sometimes it's a larger screw and there's actually a threaded post coming in there and it's a top of a screw. It's not overly important. Um, in this case, what we're going to see is there's uh, a spring back here and then this little piece that's just moving along it. So we want to not lose this spring, so I'm going to put my thumb over it as I lift it out so it doesn't launch. And then I'm going to actually move it back so that this piece is out of the, of the hole in the center. And once it's out, then uh, I should be able to lift it up. You don't want to, you don't want to angle it out while that piece is still engaged. You want that piece to always be a, well, there, there's a spring all the way off. Um, but you don't want to, you know, this cylinder is generally, this little cylinder here is generally a perfect fit for that hole. You don't want to make it any wider or create any wiggle room, so let it come back and then remove it. Now what you can see here is that it has this raised uh, square area that actually fits uh, into this cutout so that that's you know, you're holding these pieces together with that screw, and so moving the one is going to move this one very uh, straight left and right. It's not going to, you're not just, you know, moving it at an angle where it can flop around. It's going to seat in there very solidly, and that, that way you're moving this piece uh, very smoothly in only one direction. Um, there any, oh, there's one other piece that you can remove if you need to, and that's uh, up here. So this is very similar, essentially, to the, what the firing pin and its retaining pin look like. Um, because this one is fairly nice and not gunked up, I'm not going to knock it out because it just it makes the stainless steel look like hell when you take pins out. But if you needed to, if that was not moving or rusted up... Um, See, sometimes they actually give you a, a hole here where you can drip in oil. Yeah, this actually has a oil hole. So you could drop in a, a few drops of oil there and flush it through, or even some solvent, but sometimes they don't have that. And if it does get gunked up, you do have to remove that pin. And essentially, this is just the, uh, the mechanism that snaps uh, over the end of the extractor uh, when in hole you know, holds the thing closed, uh, but it looks very similar to the firing pin in that it's just a, got a detent where that pin goes to hold it in place against a small spring. And that's pretty much it for how this thing works. So uh, reassembly is not too terribly different from disassembly. Uh, I like to clean them out uh, pretty much 
to within an inch of their lives and then put a very light coat of grease on them. There's um, places in guns where you use oil and there's places where you use grease. This is essentially a closed system. Very little uh, water and other stuff can leak in. Yes, it does have you know various openings where the hand is, where the bolt is, and where the hammer is, and around the trigger. But they're pretty... It, well, it's not really sealed. It's pretty hard to get stuff in there. So it stays pretty dry. Um, so you don't want oil moving around. You want light, uh, a light coat of grease on everything. It really works well for, for revolvers. Um, so whereas I use oil on almost everything in a semi-automatic with a revolver uh, for all the inner working bits here, um, I'm... Uh, I go with grease. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. So getting that piece in is a matter of making sure it's lined up so it can go into the hole there. Getting the spring over the end of the little detent and then just tucking it into its cavity. And then I'm going to hold that in there with my finger as I come onto the other side and uh, line that up and make sure that I've actually caught it and can move it around, pop the screw back in, and tighten her up. This is a screw that you want to be fairly snug. And again, make sure that it's all moving smoothly. firing pin. I'm going to put the firing pin back together and uh, there's really sometimes this pin is pretty poorly chopped off and sometimes it has a rounded end. It really doesn't make a difference which end goes in there. Um, so as I put the firing pin in however um, I want to make sure that that cutout stays at the bottom so that when I put this pin in, oops, shadows, it can go into that cutout and hold everything in. So now the firing pin is in there. It can come out front and it doesn't pop out the back. And I find the easiest way to do this is to simply lay this piece down in there and uh, go ahead and put the spring-loaded detent in, and then um, get it first onto, start it onto its its pin, um, and as you get it on there, then you line this guy up so that it's underneath the the hole that it goes into, so that when you drop it straight down, it's engaging that and moving it properly. Um, and then the hand itself. Uh, there's a couple different... Oh, I'm sorry, actually, you know what? It's easier to put the hammer in at this point. Um, so you want to make sure that that leg is essentially between the floating leg of the hammer and the bottom of the hammer, so that, that that's, that's where it naturally runs. And in putting the hand in, you're going to use the long leg to push in that pin, or you can try and you know, come behind it with a small tool and do it, but the key is you're getting the short leg in there and you're holding it back because you don't want it to scrape down along the outside as you're putting it in, so you're going to be putting it in against some of the spring pressure. So uh, usually I can finagle that from from the side. <laughs> but not always. So in this case, I'm going to use the screwdriver to get it started and pop it in. So you want to push it all the way down and then let it come into the window so it doesn't scrape across the side. And uh, everything is in place. So now we're going to put the springs back, and first we're going to put the trigger return spring, and that, uh, the ball end tucks 
right into the top of the trigger there and just uh, aligns with the frame push that in and you'll you know, see that come flush on the other side and then uh, what we want to do is push the uh, cylinder lock back so that we can operate the trigger just a little bit and again this is a somewhat dangerous step so I'm going to use my one hand to operate the, the latch and I'm just going to put ever so slight amount of pressure of the trigger just enough so I can get this pin free and then let it come forward we don't want to use the trigger when the frame side isn't on to push that whole spring back into compression it just puts more force on it than we want and similarly uh, with the mainspring we want to make sure that this base piece fits down into the frame uh, where we want it and then we're going to do the same thing where we use the cylinder latch and we push the hammer back and get that into the recess and once we get the hammer to where it's really starting to engage and take up just a little bit of the spring pressure and get that out and then let it come back forward again we want to minimize how far we move these parts under that kind of spring pressure so we don't risk breaking off any of our pins uh, so now we throw away our safety or excuse me paper clips and get our side plate back on so this uh, you have to get this this edge in first because it goes into uh, making a video um, it goes into the frame there and then you want to uh, this is where it's a little bit tricky because all the holes have to line up at the same time so uh, anything that's in the way is going to be difficult so this hole lines up uh, with I guess that's just covered by the cavity but the the hammer pin the trigger pin the pin that the bolt is on all of those are gonna have to line up in order for this thing to properly seat so and you and you don't see so now what I've done here is I've got this end going in first which means this end is up too high so you really got to be careful to kind of get it all in it and when you get it all in at the same time it will just float down into place if you have to push down on it it's not lined up right uh, so you always want to make sure it's going in evenly all the way around and so from there we're going to pop our screws back in and <laughs> And never use the screws to push the frame plate back on that that will just be a disaster get the frame plate in place and then tighten the screws up um, so now that every the, the, the plates on we're fine to operate it and take it through all of its moves and it's perfectly happy so last but not well actually I guess what do we do we took the grips off so uh, line the grips back up um, pull that screw out temporarily probably get the grips themselves aligned this screw should go right back into place. And uh, the cylinder itself. And the last few pieces here. This is where we don't want to forget this piece or our, our bolt will have no tension on it. So we put that spring-loaded piece in and then we slide the crane on and what I just did is I bumped into this piece first and launched it all the way into the gun, at which point it was no longer 
lined up with the crane, so you do want to be careful to not do that. Um, do, 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 do. There we go. Crane slides on, and you'll feel just a tiny bit of spring tension and see the bolt pop up when that happens. Make sure the crane's all the way in, and go ahead and use it to go to the closed position. And then our last, our spring-loaded detent screw to hold the whole thing together. And nice and easy does it. We have our cylinder, it spins freely. We can close it, locks up. That's it. That is the Taurus 38 Special. Hopefully all of that was in frame this time. Stay safe.